Diagnostic Procedures by Kendra, Kimberly, Damaris, Brenna, Hannah, Bailey, Chi, and Amelia. CT scans use narrow x-ray beams to scan parts of the body in successive layers. A CT scan can provide cross-sectional views of the brain and distinguish differences of tissue densities in various parts of the brain. During a CT scan, patient lies on an adjustable bed and must remain perfectly still. Any slight movement such as talking or moving of the face can distort the image. CT scans are quick and painless and they use a small amount of radiation to produce images. IV contrast may be used to highlight differences of the body. CT scans use high sensitivity to detect lesions and other abnormalities. CT scans can detect things such as tumors and other masses, infarctions, hemorrhaging, displacement of the ventricles, and cortical atrophy. CT scans can also visualize blood vessels. When doing a CT scan, the nurse must educate the patient about the need to lie quietly and as still as possible throughout the procedure. If contrast is being used, the patient must be assessed for iodine and shellfish allergies. Patient's kidney function must also be assessed because contrast is clear through the kidneys. Patients are monitored during and after the procedure for allergic reactions and changes in kidney function. A suitable IV line and fasting of at least four hours may be required in order to do a CT scan. Fluid intake is encouraged after IV contrast to facilitate clearance of the contrast through the kidneys. MRI stands for Magnetic Resonance Imaging. MRIs are similar to CT scans except that magnetic fields and radio frequency signals are used instead of radiation. MRIs are able to better distinguish between normal and abnormal tissue when compared to CT and develops a much more detailed diagnostic image. It is a non-invasive method that allows doctors to check for abnormalities and diagnose medical conditions such as blood clots, tumors, and orthopedic injuries. Recent improvements in technology have contributed to the design of certain medical devices such as infusion pumps and ventilators deemed safe for MRI room. Contraindications for MRI include morbid obesity, claustrophobia, confusion and agitation, and having implanted metal or metal support devices that are considered unsafe including old tattoos which may contain trace elements. MRI nursing considerations. The nurse should educate the patient regarding what to expect during and after the procedure. Patients scheduled for MRI should be instructed to remove all metal items such as hearing aids, hair clips, and medication patches with metallic foil components such as nicotine patches. During the procedure, the patient should be prepared to lie on a cold hard table and slide into an include enclosed small tube. The nurse instructs the patient that he or she will hear noises, including banging and popping sounds that will occur periodically. Patients with a history of claustrophobia may be prescribed a sedative prior to the procedure. Patients should be instructed to close their eyes before entering the tube and to keep them closed as this may decrease claustrophobic symptoms. Patients should be reassured that they will be provided with a panic button that they may press if they feel they need to stop the procedure. PET stands for positron emission tomography. The patient can either inhale a radioactive gas or can be injected with a radioactive substance, also known as a tracer, which emits charged particles inside the body. The tracer then collects into specific parts of the body that have higher amounts of chemical activity, often indicating disease. On a PET scan, areas of disease show up as bright neon spots. A PET scan is an effective way to examine the chemical activity running throughout the body. PET scans are most useful in showing metabolic changes in the brain, such as Alzheimer's disease, 
locating lesions such as brain tumors, identifying blood flow and oxygen metabolism, distinguishing a tumor from necrotic tissue, and revealing biochemical abnormalities often associated with mental illness. Key nursing interventions include patient preparation, which involves explaining the procedure and educating the patient on inhalation techniques, and experiencing adverse effects such as dizziness, lightheadedness, and headache. The nurse can educate on relaxation exercises, which can often help reduce anxiety during the test. This may include mental distraction, deep breathing, and meditation. A SPECT scan is a single photon emission computed tomography. It is a three-dimensional imaging technique that captures a moment of cerebral blood flow at the time of injection of a radionuclide. It allows for behind overlying structures or background to be viewed, greatly increasing the contrast between normal and abnormal tissue. The cost of the exam is relatively inexpensive and the exam takes the same amount of time as a CT scan. SPECT scans are useful for detecting the extent and location of abnormally perfused areas of the brain, localization of seizure foci and epilepsy, detection of tumor progression, and evaluation of perfusion before and after neurosurgical procedures. Nursing interventions for the SPECT scan include preparing the patient for the scan before it is performed to increase cooperation and relieve anxiety, patient monitoring during and after the scan to check for allergic reactions to the radiopharmaceutical agent, educating the patient on the procedure and why it is being performed, and being aware that breastfeeding and pregnancy are contraindications of a SPECT scan. A cerebral angiography is an x-ray examination of the cerebral circulation with the use of a contrast agent that is injected into a selected artery. It is a useful tool for examining vascular disease or abnormalities, such as vessel patency, presence of collateral circulations, and aid in planning interventions by providing details on vascular abnormalities. A cerebral angiography is performed by threading a catheter through the femoral artery in the groin and up the desired vessel. In addition, direct puncture of the carotid artery can also be performed as an alternative route. Nursing considerations for a cerebral angiography include interventions before, during, and after the test. Before the angiography, the nurse should check the patient's blood urea nitrogen and creatinine levels to ensure the kidneys will be able to excrete the contrast agent. The nurse should make sure the patient is well hydrated and instruct the patient to avoid immediately before. During the angiography, the nurse should instruct the client to remain immobile, tell the patient what to expect, such as feeling of warmth in the face or in the jaw, teeth, tongue, and lips, and a metallic taste when the contrast agent is injected. A neurological assessment is conducted during and after immediately to observe for embolism or arterial dissection that may occur during the test. The nurse should also observe for any allergic reactions from the contrast. After the cerebral angiography, the nurse should observe the injection site and look for bleeding, assess the color and temperature of the extremities, and encourage fluids to facilitate clearance of contrast through kidney. In a non-invasive carotid flow study, you would use an ultrasound imagery and Doppler measurements of arterial blood flow to evaluate carotid and deep orbital circulation. This flow study has a graph that displays a blood velocity measurement. An increase in blood velocity indicates stenosis or partial obstruction. When obtaining this test, it is used after more invasive tests and first obtained like an arteriography or other screening tools. This technique evaluates arterial blood flow and detects arterial stenosis, occlusion, and plaques.
for nursing management in non-invasive carotid flow studies, the nurse describes the procedure to the patient by explaining the handled transducer will be placed over the neck in orbit of the eyes and water-soluble jelly is used on the transducer. The nurse informs that this is a non-invasive test and the study can be formed at the patient's bedside and is known as a low-risk test. An EEG records the electrical activity of the brain. It diagnoses and evaluates seizure disorders, organic syndromes, and comas. It's also used in making a determination of brain death. It's obtained through microelectrodes placed within the brain tissue or electrodes applied on the scalp. Abnormal patterns in electrical activity include tumors, brain abscess, blood clots, and infections. The baseline reading requires for the patient to lie quietly with both eyes closed. Then the patient may be asked to hyperventilate for three to four minutes or look at a bright flashing light for photic stimulation. These evoke abnormal electrical discharges such as a seizure potential. As for sleep EEG, it's recorded after sedation since some abnormal brain waves are only seen when the patient is asleep. Nasopharyngeal electrodes may be used when the epileptogenic area is not accessible to conventional scalp electrodes. For a depth recording, it's performed into a target area of the brain. Video recording combined with EEG monitoring and telemetry is used in the hospital settings to capture abnormalities. For nursing consideration, it's sometimes recommended for the patient to be sleep deprived the night before to increase the chance of recording seizure activity. Anti-seizure agents, tranquilizers, stimulants, and depressants should be withheld 24 to 48 hours since these can alter EEG wave patterns or mask abnormal patterns of seizure disorders. Omit coffee, tea, chocolate, and cola drinks from the meal before the test. The meal is not omitted since an altered blood glucose level can cause changes in the brain wave patterns. Also inform the patient that the standard EEG takes around 45 to 60 minutes, whereas sleep EEG takes around 12 hours. Assure that the patient that the procedure does not cause an electric shock and that the EEG is not a form of treatment, but just a diagnostic test. Check the prescription regarding the anti-seizure medication administration prior to testing. If it's a standard EEG, sedation is not advisable since it can alter brainwave activity in all patients and lower seizure threshold in patients with a seizure disorder. A lumbar puncture or spinal tap is a procedure in which a needle is inserted between the third and fourth or fourth and fifth lumbar vertebrae and into the subarachnoid space to collect cerebral spinal fluid or CSF. It is used to determine the presence or absence of blood or to administer medication intrathecally. In the analysis of CSF, normal is clear and colorless. Presence of blood indicates subarachnoid hemorrhage. However, initial presence of blood is normal due to local trauma from the needle. Specimens are obtained for cell count, glucose protein, and should be tested as soon as possible due to changes that occur in the CSF if allowed to stand. Before the procedure, the nurse should obtain a written consent, explain the procedure, and what the patient might feel. A cold sensation when the site is cleaned and a needle stick when the anesthetic is administered. Address any questions or concerns the patient may have and allow them to void before the procedure. During the procedure, the patient needs to be in a cannonball position to increase the space between the vertebrae. Pillows may be placed under the patient's head and between the knees and the nurse should hold the patient in position to decrease movement during the procedure. Encourage the patient to relax and breathe normally as hyperventilation will lower CSF pressure. Describe each step of the procedure as it is being done. After the procedure, have the patient lie in a prone position to separate the alignment of the needle punctures to reduce CSF leakage. Monitor for complications which may include herniation of intracranial contents, spinal epidural abscess, 
spinal epidural hematoma, meningitis, temporary voiding issues, slight elevation of temperature, backache, spasms, and neck stiffness. Encourage increased fluid intake to reduce incidence of post-procedure headache.